this semester is confronting Old Testament controversy, and we're confronting Old Testament controversy. So let's do a quick recap of the semester so far. I'll be pretty uh, quick and brief about it. So the first week, we talked about the text of the Old Testament, or Tanakh, or Hebrew Bible. These are all synonymous. And specifically, we talked about the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. And we, uh, the Septuagint is a Greek translation from about 250 BC. The Masoretic text is the main Hebrew text that's used uh, for most, of, most Bible translations today. This will be important today. So hold on, hold on to that nugget. Uh, we also talked about how inspiration of the Bible is not an event where God takes over a writer and like a puppet or a robot makes him write things down. It's a process that involves human and divine authors working together. Then for the past three weeks, we've been talking about evolution, creation, science, things of that nature. So we start off by uh, the, in, asking the interpretive question of Genesis 1 through 11. And what we kind of converged on is that this section of the Bible is referred to as proto-history. So it is historical events, but they are compressed and they are told in this sort of mythological language um, in a way that's not straightforward history, uh, but it's also not purely mythological. It's a very peculiar genre that's a little bit difficult to interpret at times. Then we talked about integrating Genesis with science, where we talked more specifically about the questions of the age of the earth, common ancestry, uh, and the mechanisms of evolution. And uh, there what we discussed is that there are really only two interpretations that are any, in any serious conflict with the scientific data regarding evolution. If you take a literal calendar day view of uh, Genesis 1, then that's going to... Uh, yield an age of the earth that's about six to 10,000 years old, which is in conflict with uh, the contemporary scientific consensus of several billion years old. Um, and so there are ways that you can harmonize that. You can do appearance of age, for example, things of that nature. Um, and then we also talked about the kinds of Genesis 1, and there are different interpretations. Some of them are consistent with common ancestry, some of them are not. And then we wrapped it up by talking about how Darwinism, despite all the press it gets, has been an outdated theory for well over 100 years. Neo-Darwinism has also been an outdated theory for a while, and the modern synthesis that was forged in the 1940s is now headed towards uh, something of a, a paradigm shift, if you will, a sort of scientific revolution in the biology world. Um, and so because of that, a lot of the debates over intelligent design, creationism, things of that nature, are usually stuck in the 1940s, and they're still using these concepts whenever uh, the contemporary debate is much more uh, complicated there. And then last week, we talked about uh, the question of Adam and Eve. Can I have a clicker, please? Is it working? Oh, what happened here? Sorry. Um, Sam, your uh, thing is messing up here. OK, there it goes. It seems fine now. Last week, we talked about the historical Adam and Eve, and we talked about the range of views that are permissible within the text. And then we talked about some interesting uh, contemporary scientific data that talks about how there is a potential way we can harmonize a literal Adam and Eve as the genetic progenitors of the entire human race, so long as we put them at 500,000 years ago. Alternatively, we can look at them as the genealogical headwaters of the entire human race, in which case genealogical science converges at 10,000 years ago or earlier, depending on where you go. And so we ended up with this massive range of years where we could put Adam and Eve, and nothing in the biblical text really drives us one way or the other. And our conclusion there is that the secondary theological inferences that you make are going to drive what you think about Adam and Eve. So what you think about original sin, uh, the image of God, what you think about um, predation, for example, all of those things are going to drive your interpretation of Adam and Eve more so than the raw biblical data and more so than the scientific data. So then, um, that has been kind of the end of our little focus on evolution and creationism. We're now going to turn to a new question, which is the question of Israelite origins. Um, so the biblical story uh, of where the Israelite people came from is highly contentious, and it's described primarily in uh, the pretty much the rest of Genesis, uh, after Genesis 11, the books of Exodus, Numbers, and then on into Kings. Um, more specifically, we're going to focus on the Exodus and the conquest, and this raises a host of questions. So the first is just the factual question, did the Israelites actually exit Egypt? The second is also a factual question, which is, did the Israelites conquer Canaan? Did, that, there it goes. did they actually conquer Canaan? 
And then this second question leads to a sophisticated moral question, or sorry, a significant moral question, which is, did God command genocide of the Canaanites? So these are huge questions, and I will be transparent with you. This is the first semester Rasha Christie has attempted to answer all of these questions. So some of this may not be quite as polished as it has been uh, for the, the past couple of topics that we've done uh, more than once. So for the next couple of weeks, this is what we're going to focus on. So we did the three evolution questions. We're going to do these three origins questions. So the first one's going to be, did the Israelites exit Egypt? Now, um, this is going to involve a lot of archaeology and things of that nature. And I think one thing that's really important to understand up front about archaeology is that the archaeology related to the Exodus and related to the uh, conquest of Canaan are basically the same data. Um, because these two events are so tied to each other that to evaluate the archaeology of one is basically to evaluate the archaeology of the other one. So for that reason, we're actually going to truncate much of our discussion of the archaeological data and push that off to next week, uh, so, since that's going to be a little bit more uh, relevant there. Um, and so this will be our roadmap. So we're going to do quite a bit of introduction and overview today to get sort of a lay of the land, pun intended. Then we'll talk about some textual considerations and then start getting into some archaeological considerations as well. I just realized I shouldn't be wearing that. You probably can't hear me. Okay, so let's look at the introduction. Um, so first, just to get, a, get our bearings on what the story is, this is a pretty nice summary from uh, James Hoffmeyer, who uh, his name will come up quite a bit tonight. So this is his summary of the entire origins of Israel. Owing to a famine in Palestine, the extended family of Israel, or Jacob, immigrated to Egypt and settled peacefully there for some time until their fortunes changed. Under a new king or dynasty, they were pressed into hard labor for some decades or longer before being released by a, rec a recalcitrant pharaoh with the help of a Hebrew named Moses to return to Canaan from whence they had come. So that's just a nice summary there. Um, now, the Exodus event then... That's a summary of the narrative, but the Exodus really permeates much deeper into the text than just the simple narrative. So this is a creed from Deuteronomy 26, where when the Israelites are uh, commanded to give their first fruits to God, this is how they say their blessing. A wandering Aramean was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And behold, now I bring the first fruit of the ground which you, O Lord, have given to me. So this is kind of a, an almost identitarian creed which ties up how the Israelite people thought of themselves, um, line by line by line. And you can see the, uh, the centrality of the Exodus event there. The Exodus also is the historical basis of the covenant. We're not going to get into this very much uh, right now, but uh, in the ancient Near East, it was very common for covenants between two people groups to start off with historical backstory. Um, and so the Hebrew covenants follow this format uh, similarly, they start off by saying, Here is the, here's the, histor the history between God and us, and so this is why we're making this covenant. So if you read the, uh, both versions of the Ten Commandments, the prologue to both of them starts off, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So this is a historical foundation for the laws that are about to follow. It's also used as a reminder of terms and conditions. So in the prophets, whenever Israel is in rebellion to God, and headed towards uh, the Babylonian exile, the prophets are exhorting them to return to God, and they keep exhorting them on the basis of the Exodus. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I myself made a covenant with your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, in Jeremiah. And then again in Micah, O my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, Aaron and Miriam. So the um, last section that I'm going to look at textually is the Exodus in Hebrew hope. So once the Israelites ultimately did get exiled, they looked back on the Exodus as a point of God's history, or as a historical point of God's faithfulness, and as the foundation for a future hope of deliverance. 
So Psalm 77 is an excellent psalm. The, basically, the whole thing is about uh, the Exodus, but here's just one particular uh, excerpt. The psalmist writes, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I re- will remember your wonders of old. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen, and you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Uh, psalm 78 is also another great uh, psalm on the Exodus. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power or the day when he redeemed them from the foe, when he performed his signs in Egypt and his marvels in the fields fields of Zoan. I want you to make a footnote on that uh, comment there, fields of Zoan. That will be important in a minute. So two footnotes now. Remember the Septuagint Masoretic text divide? Remember the fields of Zoan. Those will come into play later. And then Ezekiel 20, the whole chapter of Ezekiel 20 is God talking about how he will bring back the people of Israel out of their exile. Uh, and he ties it in directly to the Exodus and his previous historical actions in the Exodus. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. And I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. That phrase, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, uh, comes up a lot. In fact, it's almost used exclusively in the context of God's uh, deliverance. And it's used most significantly in the Exodus. Now, this is kind of just a side note. This is kind of an interesting passage because the entire book of Ezekiel, God is exorbitantly mad at Israel. And so even in this passage says, yes, I will rescue you, but... That's, that's not going to be the end of it. You're still going to have to suffer for the, the great evils that you've done. And they truly were evil. That is a conversation for a different time. Bring that up at the intensive tomorrow if you go to that. Ask them, ask them about the book of Ezekiel. So, okay. So we just talked about three basic things. We talked about the Exodus and the Covenant. We talked about the Exodus and hope. And then we also talked about the Exodus as a narrative. So let's sort of synthesize this and ask, what really is at stake with the historicity of the Exodus? So last week we talked about the historicity of Adam and kind of what would happen if there were no Adam. Um, And one thing interesting about that is Adam doesn't really show up in the Old Testament with the exception of the Genesis narrative, obviously, and then a line in 1 Chronicles, uh, and then occasionally there are some vague references that might be to Adam in other books. But radically unlike Adam, as we've already seen, the Exodus event permeates the entire Hebrew Bible at multiple strata in the text. So the entire event, of course, is celebrated by the Hebrew people every year in the uh, Feast of Passover. And there are other feasts that are attached to it as well, but of course, the Passover is the most significant. We mentioned it's already the prologue to the covenant. It's the foundation for the trust in God. And here's the important part. It is the paradigmatic expression of God's redemptive intervention for his people and depiction of future salvation. So for those of us that are Christians, the role of the resurrection in our hope for the future is almost exactly parallel as an ancient Israelite's hope in deliverance from uh, exile. So for us, we look backwards to the resurrection of Christ um, as a historical testament to our future uh, redemption from this world. Likewise, um, an ancient Israelite would look back to the history of Exodus as a point of hope for future redemption from exile. So this raises a question. If Christ is not raised in Christian hope, then your faith is in vain. That is, that is what Paul, Paul lays down the gauntlet and says that is exactly, those are the conditions on which the Christian faith falls apart. If Christ is not raised. But the question is, if the Exodus didn't happen, and the Exodus conquest, if, if that was not historical, then would your faith be in vain? If Jericho is not raised, is your faith in vain? I wish I came up with that myself. Yeah, I wish I came up with it myself. Um, and so this is an interesting point of analysis here. Uh, And so for that, I'd actually recommend this book um, called Evangelical Faith and the Challenge of Historical Criticism, which basically asks this question about multiple contentious issues in uh, in the Bible. It asks, if there is no Adam, what happens to historical uh, Christian faith, specifically conservative evangelical faith, which is is what my own tradition is. And so this is the assessment that uh, Christopher Ansbury, who's the guy who wrote this, um, not in this quote, he does say, The Christian faith, if it is founded in a sufficiently strong Christology, can survive anything, including a non-historical exodus. But that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be downstream effects. So um, 
the exodus and the historicity of it is definitely a point of contention for a lot of people and is definitely something that uh, has caused a lot of people to doubt. I would say that it's more significant than issues of creationism, honestly. Um, and so just as a point of, I don't know, dare I say pastoral concern, I'm not a pastor, but just as a point of sort of, if, if this is a point that you're struggling with, the Christian faith can absolutely weather any attack with the exception of the attack on the resurrection. So as long as you're grounded in the resurrection, being agnostic or open or confused about parts of the Bible are, uh, there, it, it's not going to upend, it doesn't mean you have to upend everything. But Ansberry does say that there are significant effects if there's a non-historical exodus. He says, if Yahweh never intervened on Israel's behalf to deliver her from Egypt, then the nation's identity as the elect people of God is deprived of its very foundation. What's more, if Yahweh never intervened on Israel's behalf to save her from Egypt, then her hope that Yahweh would again intervene in history to exact her deliverance from exile is largely baseless. For her expectation of future deliverance is grounded in the historical reality of God's redemptive release from the Egyptian bondage, which I think is the point that I've kind of already made with the text themselves. So that's a pretty um, significant issue, particularly if you are an ancient Hebrew. Now, we're not ancient Hebrews, and I would, I would say that you can advance an argument uh, for the resurrection that's historically grounded and could weather a non-historical exodus. But I do think that this is a fairly significant issue if it's not historical. So now the question is, what do people that look at this for a living, um, what do they say about it? What's the sort of state of scholarship? So the first thing is we have two lines of data related to the exodus. The first is, of course, the biblical data itself, the biblical narrative, and some of the things that we just mentioned. And then, of course, for the past about 200 years, people have been over in Syro-Palestine uh, Syro digging things up. They've been digging things up out of Egypt and, and in Palestine as well. Uh, so we have archaeological data as well. Unfortunately, and this may be a shock for, for some people, there is no direct biblically independent evidence for the exodus and conquest. In other words, nothing that has been dug up anywhere in the Middle East has been like a piece of paper that says Moses was here or um, our city was destroyed by Israelites or something to that effect. And that can be alarming for some people. Um, but that th that is factually the case. There just is no direct biblically independent evidence. There's a lot of evidence and it's about, you know, the general environment of the Middle East uh, and then of course there are the biblical narratives as well, but for, in the most part they don't really intersect until you get later past the conquest and into the, the monarchy. Now one thing that's important, I mentioned earlier, the exodus and the conquest stand, kind of stand and fall together. That's not exactly true, we'll talk about that at the very end, but for the most part, scholarship basically went looking for archaeological evidence of the conquest narrative, didn't find it, and then decided that if there was no conquest, then there must not have been an exodus, right? Because if there was no invading force of uh, Israelites, then that means they didn't leave from anywhere. That was the reasoning. So as this quote says, once Alt, uh, Albert Alt was one of the first guys who made this argument, had knocked out the props from under the conquest account, he had destroyed the moorings of the Exodus. And so for most of the 20th century, this is what archeologists have more or less said. They've said that there's no direct biblically independent evidence of the conquest. Um, so it largely comes down to what your judgment of the Bible is. And if you don't really think the Bible's historical, then you don't have a historical basis for believing this anyway. So it's a pretty dark, uh, grim assessment. <laughs> I will be frank with you. Uh, but things have been changing in the past couple of years. So um, let's probe a little deeper into that remark I said, that if there's no independent data, then it comes down to what you think about the Bible. So there are largely speaking two schools of thought on how to relate these two uh, fields of data, the biblical data and the archaeological data together. The first school is called minimalism, and you can remember them by the maxim, guilty until proven innocent. And they basically say the Bible, and specifically the, the uh, history of the Hebrew people, is a purely theological work. It is a thoroughly unreliable source of historical information because it is primarily propaganda that has been put together uh, in the 500s. And unless and until archeo explicit archeological data uh, emerges that proves otherwise, we should assume that it's false. So they infer, well, there's no direct evidence, that means no exodus. Okay, so that's minimalism. The second group is maximalism, makes sense. And they have the exact inverse, innocent until proven guilty. And basically they're saying, ancient Near Eastern texts 
in general are going to, well, they, they take a step that says basically archaeology and archaeological data is by its very nature sporadic, rare. Um, it's not going to be a 100% reliable source because the conditions under which things get preserved in the ground are pretty uh, inconsistent. We talked about that some when we talked about fossilization last week. And so ancient Near Eastern texts, if we're convinced that they're trying to tell us something about the past, and these people actually lived relatively close to that time period, we should believe them unless we have a reason not to. So that's true of all ancient Near Eastern texts, but since the Bible's an ancient Near Eastern text, that's also true as well. So broadly, the Bible contains historically relevant accounts and should be given the benefit of the doubt when claiming to communicate historical events. So no direct evidence just means the Exodus has not been ruled out. All right? So minimalism, guilty until proven innocent. No evidence means it's false. Maximalism says innocent until proven guilty. No evidence means it's still on the table. Um, unless and until we find corroborating or contradictory, contradictory uh, evidence. Now, um, I would like, to, personally, I'd like to spend a lot more time on this particular issue because I think it's a very interesting uh, epistemological and philosophical question. Um, there's a fellow by the name of William Deaver. I really liked his analysis of minimalism. He himself is not a friend to conservative evangelicals, I'll tell you that much. But he basically has said minimalists are better described as nihilists because they essentially say you cannot construct a history of Israel you, because otherwise, you know, they're if all you have is just what you dig up out of the ground, there's literally no way you can reconstruct this. And so for them, they're kind of largely led to this uh, um, view that Israel, ancient Israel, is just a literary creation that doesn't exist in, in the real world at all. Deaver has pushed back extremely hard, very persuasively against that view, I think. Um, so if you ask me, I think that it really should be, this view should really be nihilism, Deaver should be a minimalist, and then maximalism could be everyone to the, to the right of him. So I um, hope that's clear. Any questions on minimalism and maximalism? Okay. So one thing is irresponsibility. People get really upset at this idea of there's no direct evidence. And um, that makes people uncomfortable, and I understand. It makes me uncomfortable, too. And so this is where you'll see, how do I put this charitably, garbage like this. I don't know how many of you have seen this. This is a claim that has been made that some archaeologist went diving at the bottom of the Red Sea and found a massive deposit of chariots and chariot wheels and bones, all dated by a super fancy scientist uh, to be exactly from the 15th century BC. How many of you have seen this, out of curiosity? Okay, all right, a couple people. This was, this was circulating when I was a kid. Like, this is how long around this has been. Now, I can tell you for a fact, these things have never, ever shown up anywhere. They, these don't exist. Here, let me go ahead and put my X on there. These have never shown up in a museum. They have never been dated. They have never been photographed beyond whatever these photographs are, and they might as well not exist. Um, and this actually leads to a, 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 an important tangent, which is if you're interested in apologetics and you're interested in you know, trying to provide good arguments for, uh, um, for, belief, in, uh, for belief in Christ, this is the kind of garbage that you want to stay away from. You have this tension of, oh, i got to prove the Bible. i got to do it. And if there's no evidence, then any evidence will do. And so you kind of concoct this evidence out of nowhere. And this is an example of where people, if you try to share this with somebody who's skeptical already of your claims, and you say, this proves the exodus, and all it takes is 10 seconds of evaluation, now you've lost all credibility. Or even worse, if someone says, man, I'm really doubting the exodus, and you say, oh, check out these chariot wheels on the bottom of the Red Sea. Oh, thanks, man. Now I really believe the Exodus. Then after 10 seconds, they're going to think that not only are they going to think that you're an idiot, which they should if, if, you, if you do this, but uh, they're also going to have their faith damaged by that. So if you, if you have conversations about beliefs that are important to people uh, and you put them in positions where they can just reject you outright, that's just not helpful at all. Um, so I think this is an example where is particularly in apologetics, we need to be careful about what we say and be responsible about how we argue. And sometimes that means being a wet blanket, which I've been accused of many times. So the method that we're going to follow is responsible maximalism. Not this maximalism, every single piece of data that exists must obviously be real, but responsible maximalism. And admittedly, this is a very tempered 
view, and it may be kind of boring, uh, frankly, or even, uh, I, I don't know what the, the, the term is, but some people might just look at you kind of funny and think, wow, that's the best you can do, but it's responsible. So this is uh, James Hoffmeyer, who's uh, cited before. Basically, this is what his argument is. He's one of the leading voices pushing, uh, pushing the maximalist uh, field. So he's a legitimate Egyptologist. He has real degrees from real schools. He's published in real papers. He has real books, like solid guy. Um, and his argument is not that the archaeological data proves the exodus, but rather the, but that the, the indirect evidence that is available, particularly the evidence from Egypt, because he is an Egyptologist, uh, basically allows for the biblical text to be uh, believed. And so basically the, the process goes like this. We analyze the biblical text to see what they're claiming. Then we use archaeology as a backdrop to uh, establish if there's a plausible background there. So you can see it's very reserved. We're not proving the exodus. We're just trying to say it's a plausible historical event, uh, and the, ar the relevant archaeology um, doesn't rule it out. Okay? So that's the responsible view, or the boring view, if you will. So sources and recommendations, obviously James K. Hoffmeyer, as cited. We'll also be using Trimper Longman. Um, his book, Confronting Old Testament Controversies, is actually where we got the name for this series. And uh, Kenneth Kitchen, as well, was a, he's an um, Egyptologist. Actually, Hoffmeyer's a teacher, I believe. So these are three really good resources, uh, particularly if you're an evangelical. I think all of them are, uh, broadly speaking, evangelical Protestant. Okay. So let's talk about some textual considerations. Now, this next part here is intended to be annoying. So uh, the, I have a reason for doing this. All right? So I'm going to be very pedantic, and I'm going to be very annoying for the next few minutes. And this is the question of the date of the Exodus. So th this is a straightforward question, right? Before we look at the archaeological data, we have to know when this event happened. So let's go to the Bible and see when this happened. Okay? So preliminary comments. First, ancient chronology in general, this is all chronology outside of Israel, anything. It is a quagmire. It is a completely mind-numbing, impossible uh, project. Biblical chr chronology is no exception to this. And... This may also be controversial, but there is not a single, single, or sorry, a single authoritative biblical chronology. I'm sure you've seen the Bishop Usher um, chronology uh, chart over in Rudder Theater, or sorry, uh, yeah, Rudder Tower. Um, that is just one of many. In fact, when we talked about the calculation of the date of creation, we talked about how there are literally hundreds of different versions of this, and there's not, a, and uh, when it comes to calculating past that, there's no difference. And part of the reason this is problematic is that there are no absolute dates given in the text. This is true of all ancient chronology. The Bible is no exception. It's not like you look in there and it says exactly at, on like 6 BC. In fact, all of our dates are relative if you think about it. They're all relative to BC or AD. Um, so what has to happen is archaeologists have to put together what's called a floating chronology where they say this event was five years after this event, which was six years before this event, and they have all of these things relative to each other and it just is, it slides back and forth until they can find another chronology from another uh, civilization, and it's also sliding. And if you look at, if you cross and compare your notes, you may find a point where they line up. Boom, now they line up. Now you have two sliding systems, right? And ultimately, you keep doing this until eventually you find where somebody, oh, whoops, uh, I didn't mean to do that. You eventually find where somebody said, oh, hey, today there was a lunar eclipse. And now you have an astronomical event that you can date very precisely, and that's what anchors all of these complicated chronologies to the outside world. So basically, all chronology is contingent on if somebody decided to write down whether or not there was an eclipse that night. It's pretty frightening. And if you read, I recommend, if you read the dating of Jesus' birth, that entire debate comes down to whether the eclipse that happened in 4 BC was a reasonable eclipse or whether the partial eclipse in 1 BC was relevant. Nobody, because even whenever they talk about the sun being blotted out or, or something to that effect, it doesn't actually tell you if it's a full eclipse or a partial eclipse. They just say, ah, thing in sky has covered sun. Oh no, bad. So it's intentionally annoying and bad. And then lastly, the Septuagint does not line up with the Masoretic text in the chronology. For some reason, the numbers that the translators chose do not line up. No reason, and nobody knows why. They just know that they're different, okay? So let's talk about approaches. This is where it's going to get really pedantic and annoying, and I hope your brain is numb by the time we get through this section. So the store cities approach. 
This says, all right, Exodus 1, uh, 8 through 11 says, there arose a new king uh, over Egypt who didn't know Joseph, and he uh, was afraid that the Hebrew people would join their enemies and fight against them. So they set taskmasters over the Hebrews to afflict them, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom, or Potom, and the city Ramses. So a lot of people will take Ramses and say, oh, that's Ramses, and then through a chain of reasoning, say Ramses is Ramses II, and specifically it's the city of Pi Ramses that they're building. That means that it's Ramses uh, the Great, who is the Pharaoh. He reigned from 1279 to 1213. Bingo, bango, bongo, 1270 BC, there's our Exodus. This is the view of uh, the Ten Commandments movie, which is shown up here, uh, as well as the Prince of Egypt, if you're not 150 years old and have watched that movie. Um, that's the standard view in most uh, cinematic um, adaptations because a lot of people know Ramses, okay? So here's a completely different approach, which is let's take all of the narratives between Exodus and Kings until we hit some point of synchronicity. Let's just add the numbers in the narrative until we find some historical data point that uh, hooks up to another uh, chronology. So if you do that, then it turns out that Solomon, King Solomon, he is the uh, uh, point of contact with some, uh, some ra I won't give you the details, but it's some random like Assyrian chronology. There was an eclipse, obviously. I'll leave out the details. But basically, Solomon, uh, his fourth year was dated to 966 BC. Or sorry, his reign was dated to 966 BC. That's when he took the throne. Um, so if you just start in Exodus and add up all the numbers, all the reigns of the judges and whatnot, that's 630 years. And so that gives you a date of 1596 BC. All right, so we've got two data points, and we've already got over 300 years variance between them. So that's one approach to doing this. Here's a third approach, which is the Pauline approach. So Paul, in one of his speeches, happens to give uh, a brief summary of the um, history of Israel. He says, for about 40 years, God put up with them in the wilderness. After that, he destroyed seven nations in Canaan and gave them the land for 450 years. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, who reigned for 40 years. All right, so you add those things up, you get 570 years uh, between Solomon and the wilderness. Now, the Pauline date is 1536, minimum, because there are two question marks in there, okay? So another approach is the literal chronological approach, which is we can just look and see what the thing says. So 1 Kings 6.1 says, In the 480th year after the Israelites came to Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. You might be thinking, man, why didn't we just start with this? This is a single calculation. 966 plus 480, boom, 1446 BC, we're done. Because if you look in the Septuagint, this is a different number. It's not 480, it's 440 years. And so now we've got a 1406 BC date instead of 1446 BC date. So I've just shown you five independent approaches for calculating when the Exodus happened, and they all kind of disagree with each other. So here's just five of them that we talked about. These are all from the Bible, by the way. All of them are from the Bible with the exception of the one data point being Saul, or sorry, Solomon is dated to 966 BC. That's the only time we stepped outside of the Bible to get information. So um, these are five biblical views. Here are even more views that are incorporate more data. And you see some people push it all the way back to 2100, and some people bring it all the way forward into even 650 BC. Now, in full transparency, I do not think that all of these are created equal. Some of them are better than others. But this is just to get you to realize that this question of the date of the Exodus is not a straightforward uh, thing. And um, let me remember what's next here. Oh. Uh, and so, like I said, they're not all created equal, um, but it is. It is largely an intractable problem. Uh, but I don't think it's that significant of an ordeal, largely because the Bible, I, I, the, what this communicates more than anything is, the biblical authors don't care when it happened. They just care that it happened and that it happened at a reasonable time in the past. And it's not really relevant to any of the theology when it happened. It is relevant when we start evaluating the archaeology because we're digging in the wrong... If we say, for example, that there are no destruction layers in this city during these years, but the Exodus happened either after that or before that, then it will be relevant. So we're largely going to ignore this question um, until next week when we actually talk about the specific archaeological data. Uh, and for that, these are the two main dates that get tossed around. You have a late date, 1270, and an early date, which is 1446. And the point being that you have to harm every date. It doesn't matter which one you pick. It doesn't matter which one's your favorite. You have to pick, um, basically, you have to harmonize the data in some way to fit with the other data. 
So let me give you one, uh, let me just give you these two examples. So for the late date, they take as primary, their primary data point is the store cities. And they say, all right, we know that these store cities of Ramses, that's Ramses, that's Pi Ramses, so we're talking about Ramses II. Well, what do we do with the judges? Well, that time period that we were all adding up, that's actually not uh, necessarily sequential. The, they're presented sequentially, but everyone knows that the judges ruled uh, contemporaneous. So that can be compressed because you have a lot of overlapping uh, uh, rulerships. So that can be compressed an arbitrary amount. Now what about the data point, the 480 between Solomon and uh, the Exodus? Well, this is where things get kind of weird and it's only if you've read a lot of uh, like uh, Hebrew literature will this really be that persuasive. But basically 480 happens to be 12 times 40 and 12 and 40 happen to be very significant numbers. You also have to think about what's the probability, I don't know if you saw it in the numbers up there, what's the probability that David, Solomon, and Saul all reigned for exactly 40 years on the dot? It's a very unlikely thing. And so the uh, late daters typically say the, these chronologies that we're talking about are not purely literal numbers. They're using these numbers for some reason or another, and, would, and it's not clear all the time why. And that's possibly why the Septuagint is different, that they're trying to communicate uh, messages through the numbers. And if you think that number, if you think that that's goofy, like, oh, numbers don't mean anything outside of numbers, all you have to say is, well, 666, 420, 69, 911, 1488. All of those numbers have meanings outside of their uh, literal meanings. And there's some other similar meaning that's going on here. So that's kind of the argument that they do. Are you persuaded? Maybe. There are a thousand problems and objections to all those things. The early date says, look, I don't buy this new math. That doesn't make any sense. Numbers are numbers, math is math. First Kings 6.1 says Solomon reigned 480 years after the Exodus is 1446. That's all you have to do. So how do they get around the idea of the Septuagint? Well, the Septuagint is wrong. And that's why Paul's numbers don't add up either. He was using the Septuagint. So how do they get around the judges? Well, the same as the late date. You compress them to have overlapping reigns. But what about the store cities? What about the store cities, though? Why do the store cities have the name Ramses? And they say, well, uh, these are geographical markers, and so the names were updated later by an editor. For example, we might talk about uh, an ancient... Um, uh, Native American tribe that was wandering around in modern-day Texas, and that's all that they're saying. They built these cities, but these cities were called something else, and they've been renamed, so the editor updated it so it would make sense later. Are you persuaded? Okay. I don't know. I don't know which date is right. Maybe neither of these, but that's just an example. So we've reached information overload, so you can see here just this type of minutia in trying to figure out a single question of when the date of this exodus is has already like thrown us off the deep end. So is there a way we can talk about this without going into the weeds? And, and, and yes, there is. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the textual evidence here in a second. We're going to kind of move out into what's called cultural memory, which is a sort of vague term, and then we'll start getting into the more intense data-heavy archaeology, and that'll spill over into next week. So figure we'll, we'll do that. Um, we're actually doing pretty good on time, too. All right, so let's talk about this idea of cultural memory. So summarizing from Ansberry, cultural memory perceives biblical traditions as corporate reflections on the contemporary situation of the Israelite community rather than a mere reiteration of the past. The concept of cultural memory represents a via media between the generic classification of biblical narratives as history and as myth. So you remember we talked about the idea of proto-history um, a couple of weeks ago with um, uh, Genesis 1 through 11. Ansberry is kind of saying that a similar but not the same thing uh, when it comes to the Exodus. Because it's not a purely historical account, but it's not a purely mythological account. It represents... Uh, the reflection of a culture that has had a shared experience and they then remember this experience and they reflect on it and carry it forward into new generations. In fact, this is the reason why most scholars who do ascribe some historicity, even, in, even if it's a tiny kernel of historicity, uh, to the Exodus, it's usually through this uh, means. It's not archaeologically, it's through cultural memory. So to summarize, uh, Jan Osman uh, says here, it, on the contrary or sorry, I'll read the whole quote. 
This is not to say there is no historical background at all behind the story of the Exodus. On the contrary, it's quite probable that a great many historical experiences and memories lie behind and went into the biblical story. Although certainly not one like this one in the Bible. He's, he's a German critic, so naturally he's not going to take this story as is. Um, Manfred Vitak also, he says here, the storyline of the Exodus, a people fleeing from a humiliating slavery, suggests elements that are historically credible. Normally, it's tales of glory and victory that are preserved in narratives from one generation to the next, not a story of a humiliated slave people that escape um, and then experience uh, humiliating losses later on. I really like, this is an older quote, but I really think it captures the spirit well. This is Sir Alan Gardner, uh, who he actually said, so a different quote, he said Genesis was purely mythological, and he said the, uh, the uh, history in the Bible, all claims of history, are equally purely mythological. So uh, for that as a background, this is what he had to say about the Exodus. That Israel was in Egypt under one form or another, no historian could possibly doubt. A legend of such tenacity representing the early fortunes of a people under so unfavorable an aspect could not have arisen, save as a reflection, however distorted, again, trying to say that the stories aren't totally true, um, but had to be uh, a reflection of real occurrences. So these are kind of vague considerations, right? But th these people are basically saying, this story doesn't seem like it could be preserved if, unless it was actually based on something that happened in real life. So is there a way that we can formulate these sort of vague considerations into something a little more precise? Um, and that's actually what this guy's done. His name's Tyron Goldschmidt. Um, he is a philosopher. He does not do archaeology. He does not do history. He does not do textual analysis. But he is a philosopher, and he focuses specifically on philosophy of, uh, I believe, epistemology. And so this is actually coming out in a book uh, pretty soon. Um, he's developed what's called the Kuzari Principle. I don't know why he named it this. This is not informative, but this is what it is. And basically, it's a... It's a form of what's called the principle of testimony. So in philosophy, specifically epistemology, there's this problem where the overwhelming majority of human knowledge is mediated to us, not through evidence, not through experience, but by other people telling us stuff and testifying things to us. The overwhelming majority of things. Um, and so the principle of testimony just is to say that all things being equal, if somebody tells you something, and you have no reason to disbelieve it, you probably think it's true. Um, this is how we operate in all of daily life. This is how you have been operating for the past 30 minutes I've been standing up here. I've been testifying. You believe things that I say that you believe, you believe based on my testimony. This is how you convey the truth to other people. In fact, every peer-reviewed paper in the world is, in fact, founded fundamentally on testimony. It doesn't matter how much evidence is in there. Their methodology is fundamentally based on testimony. This is how we did it. I have a whole other rant on this about people that don't that think, oh, evidence and testimony are different. But that's for a different time. So what does Goldschmidt do here? How does he apply this to the Exodus? So he says a tradition or a national tradition is true if it meets three conditions. The first is that it's accepted by a nation as a whole and that it describes the national experience of a previous generation of that nation and that the national experience would be expected to create a continuous national memory until the tradition itself is in place. So one might think, for example, of the American Revolution. Um, that was a shared national experience by the American people, um, and there are traditions that are still surrounded, uh, that surround the um, American Revolution. Fourth of July is one. You also have societies such as Daughters of the American Revolution, things of that nature. In fact, I think that's a really good example. I don't think anybody in this room has done original research into the historicity of the American Revolution. I believe we all accept it on the basis of somebody told us it happened and maybe we went to a museum. And we believed what the museum cur cur uh, curators told us about the things that were there. So he basically applies this to the Exodus. Now, um, it goes something kind of like this. Or, oh, I, sorry, I got a little out of sync here. Um, but he's talking primarily about these national experiences. Um, that, uh, broadly speaking, if an entire people group experienced something together and then they tell their progeny and tell them on and on and on, you can be reasonably certain there was at least something in, in the background um, backing it up. So let me just take a minute, uh, let you all digest that for a second. Um, 
The other thing in this paper is he goes through numerous counterexamples. And basically all the counterexamples fail to meet all three conditions. That's the important thing. All three conditions must be met. Okay. So to apply this to the exodus, we first have to get an important piece of data, which is um, we have been assuming thus far, and most people would assume, uh, that the earliest piece of data related to the exodus is the narrative of Exodus chapter 1. This is, in fact, not the case. The Song of the Sea in Exodus 15 is not only the oldest uh, piece of testimony to the Exodus, but perhaps the oldest piece of writing in the entire Bible. I have an uh, excerpt here. This is uh, the song that Moses sang and Miriam replied to after the crossing of the Yom Suf. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, so it says, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk into the Yom Suf. The floods covered them. That's Red Sea and or Reed Sea, but we're doing Yom Suf because we're not going to talk about that. That's just the direct Hebrew translation there. The floods covered them, and they went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood in a great heap, and the deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. And it continues on. Um, but the main things to focus on, the horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea, Pharaoh's chariots and host he has cast into the sea. Now, the uh, dating of this, um, has been pushed back as early as the 12th century, so like the 1100s BC, which if you accept the late date of the Exodus, is almost as contemporaneous with the events of the Exodus as anything in ancient history, which is, I think, kind of interesting. Um, but the latest this has been dated, even by the most skeptical of uh, skeptics, the latest this is dated is to the 800s uh, BC. You can read more at the, uh, the little citation I have down there. So... Um, I personally, I think the 12th century arguments are better, so we're going to go with that. So this is actually our earliest testimony of the uh, event of the Exodus. So let's go back to Goldschmidt's uh, conditions. All right. So the first thing is the Exodus event permeates the cultural memory of the Hebrew in festival song and worship. We've already surveyed that data. We have the Passover. We have this song. We have the Psalms. But this perme uh, permeation extends through all strata of the text. So we've seen it in law and the Psalms, and in historical books, we've seen it in uh, it's in mythological accountings, too. Uh, we won't go into the detail there. It's in the prophetic books. It's in the lament books. It's even in the wisdom books as well. Basically, you cannot escape the Exodus. It's in almost every book of the Old Testament. And like we just said, the earliest stratum, this is the important part, which is why we had that brief excursus, it extends through a bunch of strata, but the, it goes all the way to the earliest strata, which is the 12th century uh, BC. Again, very close to the events if you accept the late date. And then here's the bonus part, which is um, what the other people were mentioning. The story itself is a bit embarrassing and hard to embrace. First, if you accept that the Israelite, if you're an Israelite and you accept that you were rescued from Egypt, you have to observe the Torah, which is not a fun thing to do. It requires circumcision. I think I've made my point. Uh, the second one is that the Exodus and Conquest story is a mixed multitude of slaves. It's not this homogenous race of warriors that emerges from uh, some... Uh, primordial sea and then conquers the world. It's a bunch of slaves and they're miserable and they're not even all ethnically homogenous either. So um, the conclusion of all of this is just to say that uh, the Exodus tradition, accept, uh, it meets all three of the uh, conditions for the Kazari principle. Goldschmidt goes so far as to say this proves the entire tradition. That's ridiculous, I think. I, I don't think any argument could get you that far. But what it does do is it gives you very strong a priori reason for accepting the broad outline of the Exodus tradition at face value. In other words, we have good reason to think just on testimony alone that the Israelites were in Egypt and they exited Egypt uh, through the Yom Suf at some uh, probably uh, intervention from God. This is the maximalist assumption. The maximalist assumption is that we have good reason to take the text uh, as uh, a foundation. So we've actually justified our first pillar in our argument of, remember, we're doing reasonable maximalism. 
the first pillar is the text is communicating history in a reliable way. And I think this is a reasonable argument that we've made uh, thus far. So with that, we can actually start discussing a little bit of the archaeological data. But let me pause and see if there are any comments or questions uh, on this point. Um, I do not have my earpiece, so if you're in the Zoom and want to say something, uh, please put it in the chat. Any comments? Yes? It uh, seems that no matter who you're talking to about the Song of the Sea, unless it's prophecy that kind of takes the a 650 date for the Exodus off the table. <laughs> yeah, I guess it does. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. Any other uh, input? Okay, cool. So I think this is actually a, pr a fairly positive conclusion to draw from the just from textual considerations and you know epistemological considerations alone. Now we're going to start to uh, get into a little bit of archaeological data, and as mentioned, um, the meat of the archaeological data is really in the conquest. So what we're doing is nibbling around the edges whenever it comes to talking about the archaeology of the Exodus itself. So again, our sources and recommendations. Um, Hoffmeyer's Israel in Egypt, it's a bit old. Uh, it's from 90, uh, 1996. Some of you are old, uh, younger than that, which is frightening. Uh, but the, uh, this is actually still, believe it or not, the standard work from the maximalist uh, tradition. It's fairly accessible, fairly short. It's only about 200 pages. Um, and that'll be our primary guide for, for this. Uh, and importantly, Hoffmeyer wrote this book saying, I don't know when the date of the Exodus is, but all the data in here is compatible with this, with either date of the Exodus. So if you're a, part, if you're a partisan in that debate, um, this book is not going to push you one way or the other. So there are a few other archaeological quagmires that we will judiciously avoid. The first one is, how many people were involved in the Exodus? This is something that is enormously complicated, which, again, you would think, oh, well, just read the Bible. If you read the Bible, the con uh, conventional translation in English is there were 600,000 men of fighting age uh, in, that entered into the land. That's in Numbers uh, uh, 146. If you assume that each man probably had a wife and at least one kid, which is radically underestimating the uh, fertility of the uh, Hebrew people, that puts you at over 1.2 million uh, people that are moving into the land. That means there are a lot of fun math questions or uh, like math thought experiments you can do. One of them that I've heard is, or two that I thought were pretty funny. If the Israelites left Egypt, uh, ate abreast, um, into the, and just walked straight out of Egypt, the last person would be leaving Egypt when the first person entered Canaan. Like they would just cover the entire land. And the second one is, if you had over a million people moving through the Sinai Peninsula, the amount of biological evidence they would leave would have turned that into a lush garden at this point, not a desert. I'll let you do the inference yourself on what that means. But it's just an, it's another intractable issue uh, as, as to what the size of the Exodus is and what the numbers in the Book of Numbers are trying to communicate. Um, yes? Yeah, that, that's a good point. I'll repeat it for the thing. The uh, comment was about uh, one particular solution is ancient Near Eastern texts would intentionally inflate numbers as a way of exalting their king, who in this case is Yahweh, so uh, a larger people group is glory to Yahweh. That's, that's one way to do it. Uh, the one that I have here th is the debate over the term uh, Elef, or Chalef, I guess is how that's pronounced, which is, that's what's interpreted as thousand. 
Some people say, oh, well, it's actually a clan, so really, uh, if you do the math, it's different. Th but those two solutions are operating on different assumptions. One saying the numbers are not literal at all. One saying they are literal, but this term that you're translating as thousand is actually different. Intractable, not gonna talk about it. The other thing we're not gonna talk about is the route of the exodus, because this is another intractable debate, because you first have to identify where Mount Sinai is, and there are at least three uh, different um, candidates for that. We're just not gonna, it, it's just not very profitable, I, I think, for our, for our time. Uh, but there are three that are discussed, uh, north, south, and central. Uh, Hoffmeyer gets into it a little bit, um, if you wanna go into that. So let's summarize. So what actually is, so remember what Hoffmeyer's claim is. He says, the Exodus is a plausible historical event that's preserved in a reliable textual tradition and fits within the archeological background. Um, we've already talked about reasons for accepting the reliability and historicity of the text itself. But what's this indirect evidence that uh, Hoffmeyer uh, assembles? And frankly, it's gonna be a little disappointing. It's not the type of hard evidence one would want, but that's the nature of the case. It's indirect and it's circumstantial. And so the first question we have to ask actually is why is there no direct evidence? The second one is the Minerpta Stelae, that gets talked about a lot. Uh, second, or third is the uh, Asiatic slave trade during the Middle Kingdom. Fourth is the ecological reality of the plagues that are done. Uh, and then the last one, the most interesting one, I think, are the Egyptianisms that are in the Hebrew text. So uh, I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly. This is, believe it or not, we're actually almost done. This was gonna take all of like five minutes to go through this. So first, why is there no direct evidence? Um, so first, we, let's get our bearings. We're talking about this region, the eastern delta of uh, Egypt region. So you have the Nile comes up here and you get this big delta. And all of this is a giant marshy swamp area, more or less, which means that, and, and most of the things that are made there are made out of mud, which means that if they're abandoned for more than a year, rains come, dissolve them, and they're gone. So just a priori, not many things are expected to survive into the archeological record in this geological region, or, sorry, geographical region anyway. In fact, uh, there's annual flooding. So think about this, annual flooding in a place where most things are made out of mud. Uh, and all the stone is actually in the south. So all the stone that is discovered up here has been imported from the southern kingdom. So there's no indigenous stone. It's been estimated that 99% of all papyri uh, documents that were generated during the New Kingdom period, that's the Egyptian reign, uh, we'll talk about the years in a minute, it's estimated 99% of them have been lost completely because they were discarded and just dissolved. Um, in fact, when we talk about manuscript evidence, the uh, um, uh, 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 papyrus that is discovered is discovered in like really dry regions. Uh, they're not actually discovered in these marsh areas. Did you have a comment? Well, I was just going to ask a question. Is the Delta region supposed to be where the Israelites um, went after they were led out of Egypt, or is that a little uh, it's, it's where they, they live. So uh, the store cities, Pithom and Ramses, are usually identified as right around in here. I, I like how I'm covering several thousand miles right here, roughly in this region. Uh, so if you remember the, the, I mean, the plagues, like one of the plagues is the Nile turning to, to blood and, and causing a lot of ecological disaster in the area. Uh, but it's basically, yeah, it's basically all in here. And then when they leave, they cross, they, okay, I know we said we weren't going to talk about right routes, but I will do it for a minute. They either cross here and go down here and then come up here, or they cross up here and go around here and then go up through here or they cross here and go down here and go over here and then here and then here. But in any event, they're starting, they're starting right here to answer your question. Okay, thank you. Yep. Just so you know, that's a really great description in the Zoom. I know. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. All right, there, yep, yeah, there's a river, right, uh, that divides these two land masses and you can cross it one of six ways. Just, I'm sorry. Oddly enough, that's probably just as informative as the debate itself, but anyway. Okay, so, um, right, so most of the papyri has been lost. It's been estimated upwards of 99%. Um, and so the things that do survive are usually these monumental texts that the uh, Egyptian pharaohs would commission. Um, you know, so they'll etch them, you know, I'm sure you've seen pictures of them uh, before. They're either in tombs where it's nice and dry and safe, and they're painted on the walls and the, inside the tombs, or they've been etched into stone and then erected as a giant wall or something to that effect. Even those texts are very minimal. 
And you have to ask your, the question, if this happened, why would an Egyptian pharaoh spend the equivalent of several thousand dollars funding a project to memorialize a humiliating defeat from a bunch of slaves and from a foreign god that he doesn't know? So is it reasonable to find a record uh, in these admittedly propaganda, uh, uh, these admittedly propagandistic, if that's a word, uh, monuments? Um, you think about it like this. this. This might be a helpful point of comparison. Imagine if the entire United States history was reconstructed exclusively from the stone monuments that we have erected in Washington, D.C. What kind of a history would we build if reconstructed based on that? It's not going to be an honest history because we don't really put giant monuments of our huge failures. Um, I pointed out that there, to my knowledge, is no memorial of the outcome of the Vietnam War that I know of. There are memorials to the soldiers that died, but I don't know of anyone who celebrates that the United States got involved in Vietnam uh, and celebrated the outcome. Another example that I just thought of today, if you go over to the Bush Library, which memorializes George H.W. Bush, when you come to the section of his humiliating defeat in 1992 to uh, Ross Perot and uh, uh, Bill Clinton, that entire section, remember, it's an entire building dedicated to George H.W. Bush. That section is some of the greatest revisionist history you'll ever read. Because they say that Bush ran a perfect campaign and was sabotaged by Ross Perot, that evil man. How dare he destroy the Bush campaign? Why? Because why would you erect a building to a man and then honestly reflect a defeat of his? In fact, they would probably leave that out if they could, right? But they had to explain why he was only president for four years, and that's why. So I, I think that this general principle is, is good enough. Um, and then the other thing, too, is uh, you have to ask this question of why the Israelites never mentioned anything about who the actual pharaoh was. Uh, and you have to remember the theological function of the story is not to tell you about pharaoh, but it's to tell you about who God is. That's the first one. And there's another interesting theological point that the names in Exodus 1 that are mentioned are the two Hebrew midwives. Um, I'm going to mispronounce it, but uh, I think it's Shua and Pua is, is their names. So think about that. There's an interesting sermon point there about how the only people that get names in the Exodus account are two uh, Hebrew, Hebrew uh, maidservants and not uh, the Pharaoh himself. Tells you a little bit about who God values. So in sum, geogra the geology and geography is not conducive to uh, archaeological preservation, and there are a lot of reasons to think that the things that do survive are the types of things that wouldn't have the type of evidence that we're interested in for this question. Okay, any comments on that in general? Okay. Um, so that's the first comment. So that's broadly why there's no direct evidence. So some of the indirect evidence, one of the classic examples is uh, this, called the Minerpta Stile. Minerpta was the pharaoh after Ramses II. Um, and this is his commemoration of uh, one of his campaigns into Canaan. And he talks about all these cities that he destroyed and all these people that he destroyed. And this line right here is the most important. It's, uh, for our purposes, uh, it says, Israel is wasted and his seed is not. This is the first time Israel shows up in the archaeological record outside of the Bible. And uh, broadly speaking, uh, Hofmeyer just says that the mention of Israel in the stele uh, suggests that the tribal Israel was already a significant present in, uh, presence in the Levant uh, prior to the uh, sedentarian, uh, sedentary, uh, sedentary uh, theory described by uh, Finkelstein. So this was kind of a throwaway comment in a broader context. We'll actually talk more about the sedentary theory uh, next week. But for our, our purposes, this is from 1208 BC, broadly speaking, and Israel shows up. So if there's an exodus, it's probably going to happen before 1200 BC. Okay? So that's the latest date. Um, and that's actually good. So even if you affirm the late date, that actually kind of makes sense. There are some other interesting arguments that are related to this, but that's as far as we'll go. Uh, the third one is the Asiatic slave trade during the Middle Kingdom. So here is a picture from uh, the inside of a tomb, and you will notice the, uh, this is a description, or sorry, a depiction of the brick making process. So you'll notice here on the left that there are uh, some men that are uh, pulling water out of a pool, um, and then they then bring it over here to this guy who starts stacking these rectangles, which of course are bricks. Um, actually, I think that I got that cycle messed up. But in any event, they're measuring yeah, they're measuring it out the uh, amount of clay that they're going to use. They give this guy uh, some clay in his bucket. This guy up here starts shaping it, and then they give it to this guy, and he stacks it. So basically, it's brick making. Um, 
Here are some more people carrying bricks and doing things of that nature. The important thing to note here, uh, unfortunately this is not in color. The color version is a little bit better, but uh, the hairstyles that are depicted here, um, and where is the one? Maybe it's not on this one. But anyway, uh, people that analyze this stuff basically say that the people that are depicted here are uh, Asiatics or West Asian or Semite broadly, so people from the Canaan, uh, Canaan region. Uh, and they're also Nubians, so there are also Africans or Sub-Saharan Africans that are being used uh, for slave labor here as well. Um, so in summary of this, uh, so Egypt was frequented by peoples of the Levant prior to all this slavery activity. Uh, the nomads in Canaan, uh, if there was famine or there was a lack of rain, they would come down to Egypt because Egypt has a nice big river where they get their water and they're not dependent on rain, whereas uh, the uh, uh, nomads of Canaan are. And so because of this coming and going during the famine season, this is what's described in Joseph, in the Joseph story, of course, that there's a nice uh, alignment there. Uh, but because of this coming and going, there was a significant Semitic population during the New Kingdom, which was 1550 to 1100 BC. Um, and uh, this was most likely what the Pharaoh of Exodus 1 was afraid of. There was a giant influx of these Semitic people that were outnumbering the Egyptians, and they were afraid of a hostile takeover of Egypt. This actually happened during the Hyksos period, which is an interesting uh, comment for later. Um, and so following the, so actually, let me talk about this. So there, there was actually a period called the Hyksos period where there were Semitic people that were in charge of Egypt for a while. Then the native Egyptians finally wrested back control, uh, and then they started uh, a series of very violent military campaigns into up into Canaan and started, um, bringing back slaves uh, from, from that region, uh, particularly as um, prisoners of war. And so this is actually what's described in those uh, drawings that I was showing you. Those are laborers in the tomb of Rechmir, I think is how his name is pronounced, who was a vizier of uh, Tutmos III, which was in the 1400s BC, which is contemporaneous with whatever view of the Exodus you want to take. And so that indicates workers that were taken as prisoners of war from campaigns into Canaan and Syria. Um, so let's see here. So to summarize really quick, so Minerpta State lay, uh, we have uh, Israelites active in 1200 BC. We have uh, a big influx of Semitic slaves uh, during the 1500s BC. So we've got a nice window here of where they would fit. Um, and that accords nicely with whatever view of the text you take. Uh, the next one is the etiological reality of the plagues. Um, basically, all this says is that the plagues that are described actually make sense in the context of Egypt. There is an interesting paper which tries to give a naturalistic account of the plagues. Um, and just to summarize, basically all he's saying is that the river turning to blood could possibly be uh, uh, part of the inundation, uh, the annual inundation of the Nile River. And he basically traces down this chain of reactions that could actually have led to all of these events uh, described as plagues. So there's a big inundation, there's uh, this particular bacteria that gets into the water which turns it red. This activates the frogs because they're in an unfamiliar situation. You have a lot more stagnant water, so you have more insects that are breeding. Uh, the insects that breed then spread West Nile virus to uh, the um, 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 livestock. Uh, there's also a breed of fly that's uh, more active during this time period, which burrows into people's skins and creates boils. That's his hypothesis. Now, I don't want to talk about the naturalism versus the supernaturalism of the uh, of the plagues, but the point here just being that this actually fits as an ecological catastrophe in the Delta region. Um, yeah, so here, here's the note that I have here. So my point in bringing this up is not, and Hoffmeyer's point as well, is not to say, oh look, we can rationalize the plagues away as these natural events. Rather it's to say um, that these plague narratives reflect a very plausible and a very relevant ecological catastrophe in the East uh, Delta region. Um, for example, if someone says that God brought a plague of, um, say, like a snowstorm to Texas, someone might think that person's never been to Texas. We don't really have snowstorms here. Um, you could even say, maybe even more provocatively, would be like in the Caribbean, where it doesn't even seem to make sense at all. Clearly, you don't have any familiarity with the Caribbean to know that a snowstorm doesn't happen there. Um, whereas in this case, the ecological factors, they match up. So that's another indirect line of evidence. Um, and so actually Hoffmeyer's conclusion is pretty good on this. He says the first six plagues in the series of nine neatly fit into the Nile's annual inundation series. 
and the seventh through ninth plagues uh, are not out of place in the valley either. Um, and they also make for a good theological point as well, because Pharaoh, being the one who's responsible for maintaining cosmic order, has proved to be impotent against Yahweh. So the other line uh, here is that the Egyptians were relying on Pharaoh basically to maintain uh, order, and particularly order in the ecological world, you know, keeping the Nile running and whatnot. So for uh, these plagues to make sense to the Egyptians as a theological referendum on Pharaoh, they have to actually fit with what the Egyptians were expecting. An ice storm wouldn't really tell you much if you don't have a god that controls ice, for example. Uh, but that's kind of what is uh, the point here. And then the last point, uh, which I think is an interesting line, is the Egyptianisms that are present in the Hebrew text. So one example of this, this actually is two burns with one stone. So if you read the uh, Moses story, his birth narrative of how his mom uh, is uh, trying to save him from the uh, uh, genocide of all the babies, puts him into a basket, sends him down the river, he's rescued by Pharaoh's daughter and accepted into the court. There is an argument which says this was stolen from the story of Sargon of Akkad, uh, who has a very similar story. He, as a baby, was put into a little uh, boat and sent down the river. There are a lot of ways, uh, for reasons that we do not have time for, that argument is actually not accepted by anyone actually in scholarship. But one argument um, is the fact that significant nouns that are brought up in the story of Moses are Egyptian. They're not Akkadian. Uh, so if this was being stolen from uh, the Akkadian account, um, why on earth would you take all of the nouns and replace them with Egyptian nouns? So that's the first line. So it's a nice polemic against that argument. And then secondly, it shows that whoever was writing this story was highly influenced by uh, the Egyptians, which is what you would expect from someone writing a story that takes place in Egypt. Um, so these are the uh, five words that Hofmeyer references. Most of them are taken straight from Egyptian and literally just translated right over. The one that I think is uh, particularly interesting is the term for river that's used to describe the Nile. They, uh, the typical uh, term for river is Nahar, but that instead what they use is this term Yeor, if I'm pronouncing that right. But this is a term that is specifically taken from Egyptian to describe the Nile River, not to use just a generic river. So I think that's kind of interesting. And then the other one that's interesting is this term, Suf, which is the term for reed. So the Yam Suf is the Sea of Suf, and Suf is reed, and that means it's the Sea of Reeds, not the Red Sea. Fake news. I know. Actually, while I'm on that point, so let, let, let me explain that. So there's a debate over is it the Red Sea or the Reed Sea or the Sea of Reeds. Uh, it, it's the Sea of Reeds for linguistic reasons. Um, the Hebrew says Sea of Reeds. The Septuagint reads uh, Red Sea uh, because it was translated into Greek. No one really knows how that translation happened. And then the Latin Vulgate also renders it as Red Sea as well. So an interesting side point is most people who are major defenders of the Masoretic text do not follow the Masoretic text on this particular point. They usually insist it's the Red Sea, not the Reed Sea. Um, now, I know that the Latin Vulgate has a special place in the hearts of some members, so I'm not going to go any further, but my particular position is I think it's Reed Sea for the linguistic reasons here. That is a completely annoying, pointless argument. I don't want to go into it beyond that, but that's just, if you're interested, that's what that is. The other Egyptianism that's interesting is the Levites in the Bible typically have Egyptian names. Well, let me be more specific. There are eight Egyptian names in the Bible, all of them belong to Levites. Hophni, Hur, Phineas, Merari, Mushi, Pasher, and Moses. Moses is, in fact, an Egyptian name. And um, this guy, uh, Richard Elliott Friedman, has actually made the argument that he thinks this is one key piece of data for suggesting his theory of the Exodus, which is it's only Levites that were involved in the Exodus. The house of Joseph was the only clan that actually went down into uh, Egypt, and the house of Joseph, therefore, was the only one that escaped from Egypt. And so this is what he thinks is the starting point of uh, the argument. Uh, the, the tribe of Levi has attachments to Egypt in a way that the other tribes don't. We'll probably get into more detail about that uh, next week because that has implications for the conquest. But in any event, it is interesting that you have this uh, tight overlap between the two. Okay, so that's our summary, uh, summary there. Minerpa Stele, Asiatic slaves in the Middle Kingdom, um, the plagues reflect an ecological reality, and then there are Egyptianisms in the Hebrew text. So here's our takeaways, and then we'll go to discussion time. All right? So first, 
The Exodus from Egypt is a central historical touch point in the theology of ancient Israel. We talked about how it permeates the entirety of the Hebrew Bible. Secondly, there is no direct evidence of the Exodus, and while that is unnerving, we cannot give in to this sensationalism of chariot wheels at the bottom of the Red Sea, for example. We have to be reserved and cautious and careful. Uh, thirdly, by using the Khazari principle of testimony, there is strong reason to take the broad outline of the tradition, at least at face value. And then what little bit, and as you saw, these were very little, small uh, tidbits of archaeological data. Um, but what little bit of the broad outlines of the story that can be corroborated by the archaeological data fits pretty nicely in our overall scheme of a group of people in Egypt that then left into Canaan. And then lastly is that the Egyptian influence is uh, significant. Uh, Hoffmeyer makes the quip, there's little evidence of Israel in Egypt, but there is significant evidence of Egypt in Israel. So we just talked about two. One was just the nouns that were used in the Moses story and the names that were in the Levite uh, tradition. Um, but there's a lot more evidence uh, than that. Um, and then here's our connect slide. I thought I had another thing. Oh, nope, that's it. Okay, so those are our key takeaways uh, for the question of the Exodus. I'm sorry to disappoint. I know it's not a very much of a firecracker of a conclusion, but there you go. Sam has a comment. Has anybody checked at the bottom of the Reed Sea? <laughs> <laughs> well, no one knows where the Reed Sea is. Uh, that gets into the route of the Exodus, because you have to know where they, where they crossed. Those, uh, if you take the Reed Sea of the Gaps argument, then. Uh, <laughs> There might be a chariot wheel somewhere. Maybe. I, I'm not inclined to comment on chariot wheels. I have a question. Yes. So uh, you, you said something about the theory that it was only the tribe of Joseph that went in mm -hmm. and only the Levites that came out. Yeah. How does that work? Those are different tribes. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so that that's what this guy's... Uh, um, argument is. Let me go back to it. So uh, the argument goes, so uh, th this is the book that outlines it, and I haven't read it all the way through. I've just kind of read the, the key parts and seen some of, his, uh, some of his summaries. But the argument basically goes like this, which is the, um, the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis 1 through 11, is divided into three parts, first of all. And it has uh, Genesis 1 through 11 is the entirety of human history that is compressed into 11 chapters. Uh, Genesis 12 through, what is it, 40, I think? I may get that number wrong. The mid part is Abraham and his immediate descendants. But you have basically like 25 to 30% of the end of the book of Genesis is devoted just to Joseph, like the Joseph story. Um, and so the argument goes, the relationship of Joseph to Egypt is... Uh, probably more significant than uh, the relationship of the rest of the tribes uh, to, to Egypt. Um, now, for uh, Friedman's argument, he, he basically says, if you look at the influence of uh, or, you know, these Egyptianisms, they always show up with the, Levi, with the Levites. The Levites are the ones that are sort of the caretakers of the tradition, as it were. Um, and so that's where his argument goes, that they were the primary group that were involved in the, uh, in, in the uh, uh, they were the one that were involved in the exodus primarily. Now, how those two things square together, I honestly do not know. I think they may actually be two independent theories. The, one's the house of Joseph, and then one of them is the Levites. Or it could be that the house of Joseph became the Levites, or that the tribes are made up after the fact. That could be actually what the argument is. I don't know for sure. Um, but the, the argument just says that the data suggests the, the, the Exodus is highly interested in the house of Joseph and there are a lot of interesting connections to the Levites in ways that are not the other ten tribes. Yeah, I was just puzzled by how you could put in Joseph and come out with Levi. <laughs> Does he have uh, any other positive reasons for believing that the rest of Israel was never in Egypt? Yes. Um, so... The conquest data is particularly important for that one. Uh, so the, the general summary is that um, the, there is a lot of evidence that would lend itself to say that the Israelites emerged as a group in Canaan rather than exited from Egypt and then invaded as a separate group. So Friedman's view on this um, is that 
there was a group of, Can- of Canaanites that later became Israelites, uh, and there were these Levites that were in Egypt that exited and then came into Canaan. Um, and because of the fact that they shared like a common bond or something, or they had a shared religious identity or something, it's kind of vague, I, I don't know the details, they ended up sort of joining together. In which case, he's saying that the entire architecture of Abraham has a son who has a son who has 12 sons, that entire architecture is artificial, which is what most of this is predicated on uh, in, in, in that respect. Um, so I don't know if I can really endorse it without saying that that's probably going to do a lot of damage to the narrative. Um, but he would basically say the uh, you have 11 tribes that emerge in Canaan. You have this other tribe that sort of just shows up because they ran away from Egypt, um, and then they join forces. And it's kind of vague on, on, on that front. It does have one added benefit, though, which is you, we talked about earlier, you can't have an exodus without a conquest, or you can't have a conquest without an exodus, right? But Friedman's view says you can, you can have an exodus without a conquest. It just requires you to give up that the architecture of the sons of Israel is anything legitimate. It, it, again, it pushes the edges of things that I don't know are, I don't know, acceptable, if you will. Any other uh, comments? Four, five. Sure. Um, so this was a controversy that I didn't even know existed until tonight. Uh-huh. Um, is it a really big deal um, right now? Among scholars? Well, um, it depends on what you mean by a big deal. Uh, the, this is also not going to be a very uh, fun comment. Most archaeologists don't care about the Exodus uh, anymore. The, at least zero palestinian uh, archaeologists. They, um, since about the 90s, most people have kind of considered there's not going to be any progress on this. Archaeologically, uh, you're, you're kind of in this point of agnosticism. So you either kind of just accept the Bible or you don't accept the Bible. And frankly, a lot of archaeologists don't. There are interesting historical reasons for that, but a lot of them just don't. Um, And so most archaeologists just don't care. In fact, one guy just said, for me, this has been a dead issue since the 90s, and I just, I don't care about it. In evangelical circles, it is still a hot debate. In fact, next year, there's a book coming out called Exodus Five Views, um, and this particular view, Friedman's view, has recently been getting a lot of press. Uh, it came out, this book came out in 2017, where you basically have had kind of this polarizing effect, where you have people that either say, the entire story is bunk, there's nothing to it at all, you only believe it if you're a crazy fundamentalist. Or you say, I believe the entirety of it, uh, you know, 100%, exactly as the Bible says, uh, I don't care what the archaeology says, I just accept it as it is. And you've had people like Hoffmeyer and Kitchen, as well as one of them, that have been kind of in the middle saying, no, we need to incorporate our archaeology and our biblical data together in a way that makes sense. Um, But most people just sort of dismiss it. The archaeologists just say, oh, this is crazy fundamentalism. But Friedman, interestingly, Friedman's actually Jewish. He's not evangelical. He doesn't have a dog, really, in, in, in that fight. But he basically is saying, why don't we actually reflect on what the texts say and actually bring that to the forefront on our archaeological data? And maybe we actually can make some positive progress here. Another way of thinking about it is the reason that this may be a dead issue is because the methods that are being used are themselves dead. Think about it. If you're adhered to minimalism, where you reject all the text just outright, how on earth can you make progress on something that may, in principle, be archaeologically impossible to find? So I would say that's actually the bigger debate. Not the Exodus itself so much as the... Uh, how do we even ask the question about it? Because the traditional qu- way about it has not, been, has not been fruitful. Seven years ago, there was a conference uh, at uh, University of Southern California called The Exodus in Transdisciplinary per- Perspective. Um, and there was a book that came out um, by the same title uh, where basically they assembled all the scholars that have ever thought about the Exodus uh, to sort of give their perspective on, on the lay of the land. And the general attitude is that um, there, are, there are some interesting ways that are being pushed forward on, on this. Uh, so in particular, a lot of uh, geoscience data has been um, incorporated into the debate to really see what type of, uh, you know, to talk about like the routes of the exodus. Maybe there's some, uh, you know, geoscientific data that, has, data that hasn't been considered. Uh, 
there could be some other factors that our current technology uh, hasn't allowed us to see. You know, I mean, these books are 20, 30 years old, you know. Um, I don't know. Did that really answer your question? Okay. <laughs> are there any other comments? No, no comment. Yes, a comment. No I, mean, I think part of the problem is that Christians just aren't doing archaeology anymore because most of the most of the scholars that actually work in this field don't have very charitable don't have very charitable views like Starbuck. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why like, more people should do it. <laughs> yeah, that that's very true. In Wait fact, the, what do you know about archaeology? It's not like you have a source or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> this, is, this, uh, this is the uh, textbook for the, for the uh, class that mm -hmm. I Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's a pretty good the one. The biblical archaeology class for Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, for a, a lot of these archaeological discussions, unfortunately, are. It, it's not like discussing the resurrection, because the resurrection, there's some really good, strong evidence there. And you usually leave thinking, wow, this is actually really convincing. Every book I've read on the Exodus has led me more or less just ambivalent about the whole thing, uh, just because the amount of data that's being talked about is so, it's so mind-numbing, frankly. Um, but I think that at least the position that is safe to stake out is just to say that the reality of this event uh, is actually not ruled out by the archaeological data. Um, and that may be, again, wet blanket con uh, conclusion, but I think it's, I think it's reasonable. Uh, and the, actually, the, the book I mentioned earlier, The Evangelical Faith and the Challenge of Historical Criticism, the conclusion that they reach actually is, maybe all of this doubt about the Exodus is a reason why people who are committed to the text should get involved in archaeology. Um, because if you are continually doing the same things over and over again, you're never going to have any success. You know, but it could be that people who are committed to the text can bring a fresh, uh, viable perspective in a way that people that aren't. Uh, can't. Okay. Um, anybody else? Anything in the Zoom? Doesn't look like it? No? Are we all sad? Okay. So next week we're going to continue on this very sad <laughs> trajectory and we're going to talk about the conquest. Because the conquest for me, I think, doesn't have a good answer. Either A, it didn't happen, and now that's now you've got this biblical problem. Or B, it did happen, and now you've got this genocide problem. So preview of coming attractions, there's not going to be a good answer on the other side of that, either way you go. So I'm sorry if I made anyone sad uh, to this, uh, for this. But yeah, um, it, it is controversial, but it's not. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the arguments have really been overstated. Uh, the arguments against the Exodus have largely been overstated. Uh, on that. So, if there's nothing else, uh, we can wrap up and um, I'll stick around.